Oh, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Cherish Periwinkle? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Cherish Periwinkle was born in Jacksonville, Florida on December 24, 2004. Her mother, Rain Periwinkle, and her father, Billy Giroux, had a turbulent relationship. The couple fought over custody. Rain was awarded primary custody of Cherish as the custody dispute continued. Rain had two other daughters as well. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On June 21, 2013, Rain and her three daughters visited a Dollar General store on Edgewood Avenue in Jacksonville, Florida. Rain wanted to buy clothing for her daughters. When she was in the store, she encountered a 56-year-old man named Donald James Smith. This was at about 7.30 p.m. Donald had a long criminal history. He had been released from prison on May 31, only three weeks earlier. Donald could tell that Rain was having difficulty paying for the clothing, he said that he had a $150 Walmart gift card that he and his wife never used. He offered to take Rain and her three daughters to Walmart in his white 1998 Dodge van, claiming that his wife would meet them at the store. In reality, Donald did not have a wife. He had been married earlier in his life, but was divorced by this point. Rain agreed to go with Donald, and she and her daughters traveled in his van to a nearby Walmart located on Lem Turner Road. Donald, Rain, Cherish, and Rain's two other daughters walked around the Walmart store selecting various items. At around 10.30 p.m., Donald offered to buy cheeseburgers at the McDonald's that was located in the Walmart. Donald told her that he would take eight-year-old Cherish with him to get the food as Rain and her two other daughters tried on clothing in the fitting room. Donald would meet them at the checkout line. Instead of going to the McDonald's, Donald and Cherish walked out of the Walmart store and entered his van. Donald was not holding on to Cherish, and she did not appear to be in distress based on video captured in the store. The pair simply walked right out of the door. Anyone looking at them would have no reason to suspect that they were witnessing a kidnapping. When Rain made her way to the checkout line, there was no sign of Donald or Cherish. Rain alerted a Walmart employee who helped her search every aisle, but they did not have success. Rain called 911 at 11.18 p.m. She explained to the operator how she believed Cherish had been kidnapped by Donald. She had been in the store for two hours, but Donald's wife never showed up. She had a cart full of clothing that he was going to pay for. Rain had a bad feeling about him and was pinching herself because the offer to buy the clothing was too good to be true. An Amber Alert was issued at 4.21 a.m., now on June 22. At 8.34 a.m., a witness called 911 and reported seeing a suspicious vehicle matching the one she had seen on TV. It was located at Highlands Baptist Church on Rutgers Road. 23 minutes later, at 8.57 a.m., a police officer spotted Donald's van driving south on I-95. He was pulled over at 9.05 a.m. and taken into custody. Cherish was not in the van. Following up on the tip about the van being spotted at the church, the police searched that area. At 9.20 a.m., they found the body of Cherish Periwinkle in a creek. Donald had committed an assault of a sexual nature before strangling her. His DNA was found on her body, and her DNA was found on his. Donald was charged with a number of offenses, including first-degree murder. His trial started in February 2018. After the state presented their case, the defense rested. Donald's attorneys did not cross-examine Rain, call a single witness, or offer a closing argument. On February 14, Donald was found guilty as charged after the jury deliberated for 14 minutes. Some people were shocked by this. 
wondering what took the jury so long. On February 18, the penalty phase started. The state presented aggravating factors and the defense presented mitigating factors. The jury found that all of the proposed aggravating factors existed beyond a reasonable doubt and rejected all but two mitigating factors offered by the defense. On May 2, 2018, Donald Smith was sentenced to death. He filed an appeal. It was denied by the Florida Supreme Court in April 2021. His defense team is working on the next series of appeals. It could take 10 years or more for Donald to exhaust his appeals. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Donald Smith had a very troubled history. He sustained a traumatic brain injury at the age of nine and started violating societal norms related to sex at the age of 10. He will go on to accumulate an extensive criminal history. Here's a list of Donald's arrests. In 1974, he was charged with auto theft, larceny, and arson. 1975, burglary and violating the Controlled Substances Act. 1977, assault of a sexual nature. He was evaluated after this and found to have little motivation to change. He refused mental health counseling as well. In 1981, Donald was arrested for unlawful display of a Jacksonville Sheriff's Office insignia. Later this same year, he was arrested for stealing a canoe, grand theft of a car, and burglary. Donald violated probation in 1982. In 1986, he was charged with robbery. 1987, theft of utilities. 1991, theft, attempting to escape from jail, burglary, and grand theft. 1992, loitering and attempted kidnapping. And 1998, purchasing crack cocaine. In 1999, mental health professionals recommended that Donald be permanently committed no action was taken based on this recommendation. In 2002, Donald refused to attend group therapy in prison. A mental health professional declared Donald to be a clear, present, and future danger to children and to the community. Donald was released from prison anyway, but was required to promise that he would never be arrested again. What could possibly go wrong with that plan? Everybody knows that career criminals always keep their promises. It's amazing to think that law enforcement officials could fall for this trick. In 2003, Donald was arrested for passing worthless checks, two burglaries, and dealing in stolen property, but his most serious offense was breaking that promise. In 2006, a mental health professional said that Donald did not meet the criteria for civil commitment. Arguably, this clinician disagreed with every other clinician who Donald encountered. In 2008, Donald was arrested for taking his son to what could be called a crack-challenged residential environment. This charge was dropped. In 2009, he was charged with an open container violation, impersonating a social worker, and making inappropriate phone calls. Donald was released on May 31, 2013, and of course went on to commit murder three weeks later. After his release but before the murder, Donald walked into a hospital and said that he had been on crack cocaine for four days. He asked to be committed because he wanted to kill his drug dealer. The hospital turned him away. This gives new meaning to the phrase, falling through the cracks. I guess they didn't have too much empathy for Donald or his drug dealer. Item number two, what was Donald's mental health status at the time he committed the murder? During the penalty phase of his trial, a number of experts testified including mental health clinicians. Donald was diagnosed with a few mental disorders, including antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, major depressive disorder, and severe cocaine use disorder. This is similar to a diagnosis he received in the 1970s. A major issue during the penalty phase was Donald's use of crack cocaine. There was testimony indicating that the substance use would have impaired his judgment and, quote, Crack cocaine turned him into a monster, unquote. Donald even used crack in the bathroom of the Walmart store before committing the murder. Another factor that may have contributed to the crime is Donald's neurological status. One expert testified that Donald had both CTE and epilepsy. He had little impulse control. 
It sounds like Donald didn't really have much going for him as far as his personality or his ability to control his behavior. Antisocial personality disorder would leave him being impulsive, irresponsible, and with a tendency to commit crimes. Borderline personality disorder would make him emotionally reactive. Major depressive disorder would facilitate a negative outlook on life, like hopelessness. And his substance use would lower his inhibitions. On top of this, the neurological issues would only contribute to more impulsivity. It was just a matter of time before Donald committed murder. He should have been civilly committed a long time ago based on the danger he posed to society. Item number three, did Donald's mental health status mitigate his culpability? I think that having mental disorders almost always mitigates culpability a little bit, but I don't think the mitigation was significant. Donald appeared to know exactly what he was doing when he committed the murder. There are a number of reasons why I believe this. Here are a few examples. When Donald was pulled over on Interstate 95 after having dumped the body of his murder victim, he told the police that he had spent the night smoking crack cocaine and had been with sex workers. He was trying to escape responsibility. He knew that he was not telling the complete truth. When Donald was in jail, a conversation he had with his mother was recorded. He talked about how he believed Cherish caused her own death by entering his van. Once she was in the van, Donald knew that he was in trouble based on his history. He said, quote, at that point, I was so psychotic, was extremely violent. She had to go. I don't care. She had to go, unquote. He continued by saying, quote, they are going to kill me. It's your fault. I'm going to die. I was raging, unquote. Donald talked about how he would never be able to work through all the stuff in his head. He said, quote, I might as well just die with it. Easier to just die with it because I probably will never get through it anyway, unquote. He wanted to be sentenced to death rather than life in prison because he was afraid other inmates would murder him. Donald said, quote, every moment, every day, I'll never know in prison when it's coming. I know it's coming. It's going to be violent, violent, unquote. He suggested that the outcome could be worse than dying. Donald expressed a desire to convince the court that he was mentally ill, he asked his mother for a copy of the DSM-4. This book contains a complete list of mental disorders and their criteria. It is used by mental health counselors and other mental health clinicians to diagnose psychopathology. Donald said, quote, mental illness is my whole defense. Basically, my whole defense, and it's got to be good, unquote. He talked about how if his defense was successful, he would remain incarcerated, but at least he would be in a hospital. He referred to the hospital as a, quote, civilized treatment setting where people treat you like a human being, unquote. Donald made a clear but unsuccessful effort to hide the content of his communication with his mother. He whispered much of the time and said, quote, we have to be careful about how we express ourselves, unquote. Item number four, there is no question that Donald was responsible for the murder, but many people have placed some blame on Rain. Periwinkle. She regretted trusting Donald, saying that she was skeptical of his offer, but agreed to go with him because he said he had a wife. Also, her children needed clothing, and she could not afford the clothing. Rain appeared to struggle with her mental health. She had once been committed to a mental health institution, and she stated that she had bipolar disorder. She claimed to be clairvoyant and predicted that her daughter Cherish would die by the time she was eight years old. Rain lost custody of her two other daughters less than a month after Cherish was murdered. In November 2016, they were adopted by an aunt in Australia and moved there in January 2017. Some areas of Australia can be quite arid, but the girls probably won't mind growing up in an area with no rain. The former guardian of the two girls said that Rain had a chance to get her daughters back but did not meet the criteria, which is why the state had no choice but to put them up for adoption. Rain defended herself by saying that she was unable to maintain steady employment, partially because people blamed her for her daughter's death. In addition, she was grieving and in a dark place. There is no question that Rain made some incredibly bad decisions on June 21, 2013. For example, 
riding in the van with Donald, allowing Cherish to walk away with him, and not calling the police until about 48 minutes after last seeing Cherish. Despite her series of terrible mistakes, the police bear some responsibility as well. When they arrived at the scene, they did not believe what Rain was saying, probably because of her mental health history. This delayed the response and may have cost Cherish her life. Now moving to my final thoughts. Through his behavior, Donald Smith made it clear that he would never stop committing crimes. He demonstrated in every way that he was a chronic and unrepentant offender. Officials were warned by mental health professionals, but nobody cared. Donald was set loose on society and behaved in a predictable manner. Those are my thoughts on the case of Cherish Periwinkle. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.